hello everyone. Good afternoon. And so sorry I'm so tardy. I sincerely apologize. Um, I had some technical challenges with my memory card and uh, couldn't grab another one. But now we're good to go. So thank you so much. So Imran asked a great question. What are we going to learn today? Well, I promised two things, okay? Uh, and who, Tigian, if you don't have an engine yet, let's talk first, okay? Thank you, John Slow. Blosser's right here. So, things today. The pros and cons of center drive. So, I have a center drive here right next to me. You see the little gold car. And for those of you on YouTube, you can see it right here, much clearer than uh, those on Instagram. And that being said, center drives are amazing because they feel like go-karts on steroids, especially when done properly. And the advantage is it's extremely balanced. It feels really amazing in terms of power and control and being forgiving. And the fact is a mid-engine, the one we build with a center seat is just spectacular. And Jay Leno drove it, said it was one of the most amazing thing. And he owns a P1 and says it's so amazing, right? So that being said, what are some of the cons of it? Well, it's quite invasive to build because you're literally taking out the way to tunnel, so a lot of reinforcement has to happen. Above and beyond that, you can't take friends with you, so you can't give that experience to other people. You can't have an instructor or someone else with you. And above and beyond that, um, it is quite expensive <laughs> to build. So that being said, those are some of the cons, but in terms of drivability, it feels great. You, take, you spend the first few moments on the track getting used to where you're sitting, but after that, it is the most amazing experience. You would wonder why weren't all race cars built this way. It's absolutely fantastic. EP3 said, like the spoon car, a little bit different. So the spoon is a front wheel drive application where the seats move far back, and that kind of inhibits the visibility. This one has a seat in the location in terms of forward to backwards where you typically would sit in a Cayman or a Boxster, sitting right where you're supposed to. The seat is fixed, your pedals telescope towards you, so whether you're a tall guy or short guy, you can move the pedals to your liking. The steering wheel telescope, so you can have the ability to be able to put it in a nice location as well. And the visibility, hence, is absolutely superb. And this is a mid-engine rear-wheel drive, which is fantastic. So um, vehicle dynamics is more than just where you put a seat. It's kind of how the vehicle is built, where the engine layout is, what kind of drive wheels you have, and very, very much the visibility, you know? Ah, Ren Levin says, perfect car to get away from the wife. Amen. <laughs> absolutely. What is the most difficult car to drive? I would say it's a car that has absolutely too much power. Or, like, like even the minivan makes a thousand horsepower, but it's front wheel drive. When you just step on the, on the throttle, it just spins the tires, smokes the tires. And since my drive wheels are also my steering wheel, when you have no traction, it just wants to go where it wants to, which is pretty crazy, right? And there's something else I do want to talk to you guys about, which is very important. So right where that Mazda is sitting, um, and it's beautiful, so I'll, I'll, I'll step back and show you. So, all the way back here, way, 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 way back here, is my diamond belt. All the way here. All the way here. Okay? So, this is where the diamond belt sits. And this diamond belt is where I kind of put together all of the. It has two pods, and I put it both to the wheels directly and have the opportunity. Like right where that Mazda CX5 is. And I bolt the wheels or the hubs to the dyno assembly and do my cool thing. Now, the challenge thing is a lot of people come to dyno not prepared. And I want to share with you, as my friends and family, the things that you need to do to make sure that you're okay when you go to dyno. Okay? Very, very simple steps, but very important nonetheless. Make sure that you have fluids. And that's crazy, right? You may say, well, what do you mean fluids? Well, make sure that your radiator system is topped off, that you have oil, and that you have fuel, whether you're running E85 or methanol or regular petrol, make sure you have fluids. And it may seem silly, but I've had clients come here with no fuel, no oil in the car, literally barely any oil, and they want to dyno, and the radiator half full. Some, there's a car next to me right here that had no fluid in the radiator at all, okay? So that's the first thing, you want to make sure you have fluids. Secondly, you want to make sure that your vehicle is in good health. The dyno is not a good place to start building your car because it's a bad use of your time. And for your dyno operator, you're actually wasting his or her talent to trying to help you do things that you could have done at home at our, our workshop. So that being said, make sure you come to dyno with your car already done, done it together. Then, if you are using a hub-based dyno, which is what we have, which is extremely precise and accurate, allows me to do wonderful things with partial throttle, 
please come with your wheel locks. So make sure you have wheel locks that are there that allow you to disable or take off the wheels without qualm. Please make sure that you have all your lug studs on. There are cars that come in with four lugs where one lug is missing, not good, right? It's not very safe, even for you driving on the road, so that's not good, you know? Um, above and beyond that, here's what gets interesting, like really interesting. I even had a guy who had no distributor. Make sure that your car is running in tip-top shape, that you don't have to bleed fluids, make sure your injector's already installed, make sure your clutch is already in and broken in. Yes, I had a car recently that came out of dyno and the clutch wasn't ideal. He never tested it. He just put a clutch in and came out of the dyno. And guess what happened? Since the clutch wasn't done properly, he couldn't engage and we couldn't tune it. So it just, it, it seems like very small things, but please make sure that fluids are in place, you don't have any weird leaks, your car's in good shape, that you have your wheel locks, that you have all the studs on your wheels, and that your car, even if you don't have a seat, and I've had race cars come here with no seat, that's okay. You can sit on the floor or have a makeshift seat. But please, 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 please be prepared on the dyno, okay? Awesome. Okay, that's done. The freshest 1965 has a good question. He says, what inspired the 1,000 horsepower minivan? Great question. So in 2013, American Honda, who's one of our technical partners, wanted us to build a car for the um, 2013 SEMA show, okay? And that, that year was a very strange year because the year prior, they came out with a new 9th Gen SI. And the year after that, they came out with some other new cars, I think the new Fit. But that particular year, they had no really cool offering. And I always built the wagon, maybe the first wagon I built that was a, came as a result of a super street, uh, or I should say source inner leak challenge of an engine build off and someone called me out and I ended up, oh, I'm gonna show you and I built the wagon just to prove a point. Well, the van, I said, it'd be cool to build something bigger. I, I just got married, just had a, a young family and didn't wanna give up my need for speed but also wanted something that was a nice hauler. So, sitting in the booth talking to John Yoshinaga um, who is one of the higher executives at American Honda. We had a good discussion. I said, hey, you know what would be cool? What if like in the whole Japanese culture we built a pretty crazy minivan and did a ton of power with it? Because I've done wonderful things with inline fours, you know, 700 horsepower um, D series, um, something as crazy as a 1,000 horsepower K series. Why not build something that vein with a six cylinder? It should be much easier. And that's what happened. It was actually rejected at the higher ups. So the gentleman who we interacted with great guy, um, he, um, John Martin, he okayed it, thought it was a great idea, then sent it to his boss and they was rejected. But unbeknownst to us, he approved it, got us a van, and we had seven weeks to build this thing. And it was absolutely bananas. It ended up being the most popular car I've ever built to date, I guess until the K3V came along. But the car has been on Top Gear, it's been on Car Matchmaker, it's been on Drive TV with Matt, Matt Farah, uh, it's been on, um, uh, the Jay Leno show, it's been on Netflix, it's been, it's, it's been everywhere, and it has a Hot Wheel made of it. I'm so, I'm just so proud of this vehicle. And it's something that I don't think I could ever talk. It's pretty nice, you know? Williams asked a good question. What's your opinion on the school programs like Formula SA in terms of opportunity? Would racing independently be a better option for learning about building cars for performance? I would say combination of the two. Now, racing by yourself, which I did when I was in school, was great, because it, it really, honed my, my mindset in being able to think out of the box and create projects and products for my cars that were very unique and allowed me to be very competitive on the track. But the SAE program, which I find very appealing, but I didn't participate in that because I was a chemical engineer, not a mechanical, so I wasn't even aware of the SAE program at, at Long Beach when I went to, Cal State Long Beach, gives you that opportunity where you can have camaraderie within your team and really have a great team spirit and also expose you to some really big companies in technology that can assist you, that can assist you as well as you get out. Plus, here's what's exciting. Williams, I don't know if you're an engineering student, but as an engineering student, when my company or other companies hire individuals, we prefer engineers or engineering students who have extracurricular activities in motorsports. So the formula SAE program as you participate gives you a leg up in that job search, especially when you go into technology where people want someone who's more hands-on. But I've noticed the guys who really go to the track call me crazy do better than just Formula SAE guys. So if you had a choice, doing something to track yourself, working on car would be fantastic. But if you can combine the two, by all means do that and you will have a blast. I think it's the best way, you know? Engineering Rise asking, can I talk about direct injection? Yes, and I would love to be able to break down that very nicely for you. One thing here at BCMO Tech Tuesday, to the chagrin of some of my peers, 
is it's not my goal to talk above the audience, okay? It's my goal to break down elements and concepts for you so everyone could enjoy, engineer and whatnot. So, port injection versus direct injection. Port injection is pretty much every car in here except for that lovely Mazda CX-5 over there, okay? Port injectors, I wish I could just pull an injector off this car, you know, if there's one just laying around. A port injector is one where it's like a low pressure system, meaning you have very low PSI, which many of you may see on your cars, it's 43 PSI. And it where it's a very simple, I would say, pintle or nozzle that's actuated by coils inside an injector. So an injector opens an orifice, low pressure sprays, the nozzle controls the spray pattern and it goes to your intake manifold, cool. That's what most cars are, my minivan, the, the, the um, wagon, the center seat, that Mercedes over there, the Cayman, the Mazda, Miata, the Civic, the 935 behind me, all port injection, okay? Low pressure systems, which are good, and that's what most of us are very comfortable with. Now let's talk about direct injection. You can experience pressures as high as 1,500 to 2,000, sometimes 2,700 PSI. You may say, wow, that's a lot of pressure, right? Yes, so that pressure allows multiple things to happen in our favor, and sometimes not in our favor, <laughs> as enthusiasts and drivers. So, when you have a very high pressure system, and then that pressure is directly injected into combustion chamber, or into the cylinder sleeve itself, and when it hits a piston, the piston usually has a crater, which takes that injection and makes a plume. So that plume forms inside the combustion chamber, giving a very nice, even mixture inside. So what that does, it creates an opportunity for more power. But there's one other caveat, which is really nice. When you use such a high pressure system and that very nice stratification or plume that forms inside the combustion chamber, you can get away with leaner mixtures. Yes, you can be able to boost the car close, close to stoichiometry. So what that means, stoichiometry means is that a perfect burn, when you have 14.7 parts of air to one part of fuel, you can burn very nicely to form carbon dioxide and water, which is nice and perfect. Well, you can, in port injection, you want to hover around, what, 12.2, 12.0, 11.8, 11.4, depending on what the engine requirements are. But with direct injection, you can go into the 13s, even 14s. So you now have great power without consuming that much fuel. So it's a lot more economical, which is great, you know? So that being said, you have the opportunity to have all those advantages. Now, I mentioned earlier on, sometimes it's, it's not to our advantage. And what that means is, when you want to build a high horsepower CX-5, or high horsepower Veloster N, or Type R, you tend to not be able to just easily swap over injectors like you can with port injection. It becomes quite more involved. And tuning also involves tuning the high output, high pressure pump which high builds pressure is like with a camshaft lobe, it kind of builds the pressure inside, and it has an orifice that's pulse width modulated that closes and builds pressure and opens up, and closes and builds pressure and opens up. And by doing that, it allows pressure to build with a very simple mechanical device and allows for high pressures, but that has to be tuned as well. And if you don't tune it properly, you can expire your engine. So that being said, you have the advantages of better gas mileage, leaner mixtures to be able to get a certain amount of you know, power, you have the opportunity to have even cleaner mixtures, which is pretty nice, because the mission is very clean. You don't have any worry about wall wetting, so you don't lose some of the fuel to wetting the walls that you may see in port injection. It's just much more efficient, and you can make more power with less fuel. And the piston design is a little bit unique as well, so that's very interesting, but the challenge is you can't just swap. So if you want to do, let's say I max out the Veloster N here at 350 horsepower. If I wanted more and I'm just out of pump, I have to find a very creative way of improving that pump design and running larger direct injector, direct injection injectors, which is pretty interesting, yeah? So and that can become quite expensive because we're still not that far away where these injectors are very cheap. Honda has an upgrade kit, I believe, for the S, um, for the um, Type R, and it's like $2,700, which is pretty interesting, right? And that has a, um, a pump upgrade for the mechanical pump, um, injector upgrade, and some other accessories that allow you to do that very nicely. You can push your vehicle even forward. And you may say, okay, why don't we just increase the RPM? Well, and maybe that pump will spin faster and give us more fuel. The interesting thing is that the, inside the pump, inside the mechanical pump for the high pressure system, it looks like a valve. And that valve has a spring to keep it in control. And that valve can also float. So that's why Type Rs are even limited to the low 7,000s. If you try and push the 8,000, you can 
drop a valve in your pump and destroy it, which is sad, right? So that's not good, you know? Hey, BC, do you know if a pulse chamber would work on a diesel? Yes, exhaust pulses exist in a diesel, so you could. But diesels are pretty interesting devices because you can hear straight pipe diesels, and they're not that loud, you know? But you could use a uh, um, Helmholtz tube to attenuate um, exhaust sounds that may exist from that system, you know? Rodrigo Jimenez is asking, what engineering did you study? I am a chemical engineer, and I feel that gave me a very good background in the different disciplines of engineering because if you think about what chemical engineers do, they take raw materials and create useful pro products with that. So that being said, to be able to do that, let's say you came up with a new way of making cotton candy, okay? You had a different compound and a new procedure doing. You would hire a chemical engineer to design your plant. So of course, a chemical engineer had to understand very simple things in terms of chemistry because of course, the compounds that exist in making the cotton candy have a good understanding of civil engineering because guess what? The plants have to be built with mechanical devices. You have to have a good engineering economics background because you don't want to build a plant that's so expensive and difficult to maintain. Safety engineering, because if some, one power of plant is, is in trouble, you won't be able to have backup systems that won't break the bank. Electrical engineering, because things have to be, of course, set up electrically. Mechanical engineering, because guess what? Heat transfer, mass transfer, thermodynamics, all that plays a role into making this concept of your, of your for cotton candy in a large scale. So if you have to take all these disciplines, I had to take small classes from EE, from ME, even from aerospace elective and from economics and all this stuff, it allowed me to have a very strong basis in different types of engineering, and it made me a really nice, well-rounded engineer. So that allowed me to do wonderful things I do today instead of being just a pure mechanical engineer, who we used to make fun of, by the way. Anyway, most people don't study chemical engineering. It's a very challenging course. Uh, my graduating class is a class of 12. Meanwhile, in the same year, the ME department was like 53 or so. So it's, it's, it's quite different, you know? Jimmy, STI 96 says, I make the best cars. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the kind words. It is a team effort. I am not by myself. Um, I can't build all these by myself. Uh, but I have a great team who supports me. And without them, I'm really nothing. So up front, you have like from Hedy and Miguel and also Lindsay. Um, even recently, believe it or not, Fabian's been kicking in, helping out as well. Sam, Marvin, Deron, Aaron. I have a really great team that supports me. And without them, things, things are not good. Uh, the batteries for, K for the K3, those are LG Chem batteries, and I purchased those actually from EV West. Very good guys. So I'm using LG Chem 60 volt batteries. They're quite modular. They are lithium ion, and uh, they allow me to do very, very wonderful things. And I have um, 32 kilowatt hours worth of them. You know? Um, any more news on the AM EV? Are they making DC DC converters and charges with BMS? We'll talk to the network. Great question, Cobalt. And I like your questions. You always have great ones. So the AM EV, they are launching quite a few items, and it should be literally any day now. And if you check on their website, and I haven't checked today, and maybe it's already up, you have, you have access soon to their software, and it'll tell you a lot of what's going on. So the AMEV is this, two vehicle dynamic controllers, okay? So, or drive unit controllers, I'll say. So these, these drive unit converters or uh, controllers will allow you, I think one that's about 1,500 bucks will allow you to control one motor. And I have a ton of motors in the corner over there, you guys can see that. But the next system, which will be about $4,000 or so, dollars, will allow you to control up to four motors, which is pretty great. They will have a CAN-based PDM system, which you can daisy chain, and the PDMs will have buttons that can allow you to do things like turn on lights, turn the thing on, um, go reverse, neutral, if you so desire. They'll have analog inputs and outputs as well, digital inputs and outputs as well. Um, it will have seamless integration to AMNet, so you'll be able to use their dashes to be able to read all the information. They will have a compilation of Dash software, including one from the K3V that you can grab and put into your vehicle to look at pertinent information. From a BMS standpoint, it will talk to the most popular BMSs. They may end up having a BMS later on, but out the gate, they will not. So the one that I know they can talk to very easily is the Orion BMS, which is what I have on mine as well. So I can talk very seamlessly to the CAN network. You can generate a DVC file through the Orion network. And you can take that DVC file and import into the AEM net system and be able to read and control accordingly. Um, let's see, what else would be of interest that's on the horizon? Um, you have the capability of doing things that most engineers don't have out there, either in open source or for sale, which is uh, launch control, a lot of safety parameters, even when it comes to simple things like pre-charging and getting the system up to, up to speed, being able to monitor different status or states 
before it initiates the drive unit. So for example, there's an opportunity to monitor before you turn on the negative contactor to see if there's any current existing in the drive unit system. If there's current, it will prevent you from doing that, just a safety measure. And if there's no current, allow you to do the negative contactor, then pre-charge positive, and then positive contactor, which is pretty good. So it's pretty nice, you know? What are the 935 rims? Those are Brixton Forge, uh, BM01. So Brixton Forge is a very nice company, group of guys, talented engineers and designers. They were based in Canada, but now they're in Beverly Hills, California, and they really outdid themselves. Um, this, that wheel is a collaboration between them, ourselves, and Andy Blackmore, who's an amazing artist, and also Rod Chung, who owns this car, who works at Race Service. So it was a nice collaboration between all of us, and that was the end result, a beautiful wheel set that is different from front and rear, I'm running 17s in the front, 19s in the rear, and above and beyond that, it gives a nice nod to not only the old school Group 5 racing, but also Formula E. So you can see some, some elements in that, you know? What are your thoughts on running ethanol with water methanol? Would you rather run additional direct injection? Um, those are multiple questions, but I'll try and answer in the order of importance. Um, the ethanol as a direct injection fuel is something that I would not recommend because it can be quite flammable if you just have a container sitting on your car. And when it does combust or when it does catch on fire, it's very hard to see. And if you add a, let me use the word deactivating agent, um, like water to that, which is hygroscopic, then now your caloric content is not as strong. Now methanol, on the other hand, has a much higher caloric content value when it comes to burning the same amount of air with it. Even though you need some much more fuel, much more methanol compared to ethanol, in the same amount of air, if you throw in the appropriate amount of ethanol versus methanol, the heat generated is higher with methanol. So that being said, when you add that deactivating agent, being water in this case, and 50-50 to methanol, you have not only a great anti up agent, but a nice little caloric advantage for you to make you a little bit more power based upon the fuel. So between the two, I would consider using methanol opposed to ethanol just because of its opportunity to create more power for you. Hmm? Are you planning to work with Hyundai or Hyundai again? Absolutely, we continue to work with those companies. So I don't really post everything we do. It's almost something like I, I posted last week about the Black Lives Matter thing, where some people would give me a hard time about not posting about Black Lives Matter. And my response to them, as I'll say to you, is not everyone uses social networking as an outlet for everything they do. So what I show is a very little glimpse of our lives, but a lot happens behind the scenes, some things I can talk about, some things I cannot. But yes, we continue to work with those companies. And uh, we even had discussions with American Honda on the motorcycle division a month ago during the pandemic um, lockdown. And then Hyundai, I have a Velocia N here, we continue to work with them. This year may be challenging. You may not see something from us for SEMA because I believe that Hyundai is not having a booth this year at SEMA. So you may not see something on the SEMA front from us. But don't be surprised if behind the scenes you see something, especially on the EV front with Hyundai and also American Honda. So we continue to work with them. And that car, that CX-5 back there was sent by Mazda. So we have some really cool things here, you know? Would you be open to a, do a TRD Camry project to improve driving experience? I would, son of a pain, absolutely. I love working with OEMs. They really assist us and push me to really, you know, stretch myself and, and, and experiment and explore and do things I typically wouldn't um, because they're just great people. You know, manufacturers are just great individuals to team up with. So we have an opportunity to build like something very forward thinking and it'll be something you know, old school that's been infused with modern technology, which I, as you can see, I love to do. So yes, I have no objection to working with Toyota. We just don't have a relationship with them. We do have a relationship with TRD. So once in a while, they will send a vehicle here and they'll put up on our dyno and so on and so forth when they're just tied up here in Torrance. But Toyota, um, the closest thing we have is with their PR department on the Lexus side where they send us some cars to evaluate. That's about it. But nothing with Toyota directly. Mm -hmm. What widths are your tires? Which car? Please do share, QD, because I have quite a few vehicles here. Uh, I don't know if you meant the K3, but those are 345s in the rear. Uh, what PSI do you run on electric ti 911 tires? Um, believe it or not, 30 PSI um, when I'm driving around town. If I'm going to have any spirited run, I'll bring it down to 15. And then it's, it's, it's on, <laughs> which is pretty nice, you know? Ooh, Texas Holyfield, good question you have here. It's almost a good one for me to finish before I depart. What are the pros of a rear mount turbo carriage system as versus a front mount system? Looking to plan out a build next year. So it depends. You notice that I always have these rear mounted turbo systems on rear and mid engine setups just because it's convenient. And for the type of racing I do, because I'm a crazy drag racer, right? 
I want weight where it can do the best job, which is in the rear of the car. I would never, unless it's absolutely impossible, I don't even know why I would rear mount a turbo in a front engine car. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people tag me on a Z where someone does a front engine Z and turbo mount in the rear. That's a lot of lag. You have to, you know, it takes air as a fluid, a compressible fluid, and you have to kind of compress all that air in the back. Too. Anyway, so that being said, the advantages of that is it, it leads itself to be very, very good towards weight transfer. It looks really, really cool. Um, it allows for amazing packaging. That's why a lot of OEMs do that. Porsche does that as well from factory. So I really do like that Texas Holyfield. But for a front engine setup, the worst thing I would do is if I have absolutely no, no way to mount turbos in the engine bay up top, I may go on the bottom, but I wouldn't go remotely in the rear. So I hope that helps.